Bezug Kontext TV. Wir sind hier in der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung in Berlin, die eine Veranstaltung organisiert hat zum Thema Betriebsübernahmen. Unser Gast ist heute Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf ist emeritierter Professor für Wirtschaft an der University of Massachusetts. Welcome to Context TV, Mr. Wolf. Thank you very much for inviting me. Talk about the economic and financial crisis in the United States, which is right now deepening. What are the causes for this crisis and how is it linked to the crisis in the Eurozone? Well, to begin, it's the most serious economic crisis in the lifetime of the people alive in the United States today. The only thing like it was the collapse of the 1930s, the Great Depression, which is 75 years ago, so there are very few people left who have any clear understanding of it. So it came as a shock to the United States because it had been believed because of the ideology in the United States that we had a free enterprise market system that wouldn't have collapses, that wouldn't have this kind of a downturn, as we call it, that would last now, we're in the fifth year of this. So the first thing is, it's a very, very severe economic downturn. It is lasting longer than anyone expected. It is uh, hurting, cutting into the economic system much worse than was expected. So. It is a major economic crisis, and it's lasting so long that it has now produced a political crisis on top of the economic crisis, like in Europe in many ways. First. Second, it is not a financial crisis. That is, it is not produced by the banks, it is not produced by the financial economy. Um, it is produced in the whole economy. It is just as much a part of the non-financial as the financial. The reason it is called a financial crisis in the United States is to comfort people that it's a crisis limited only to a part of the economy rather than a crisis of the whole economy. Let me explain. For most of the history of the United States, we were a society in which wages rose year after year, roughly from 1820 to 1970, 150 years, producing in the United States the highest wages in the world, producing a belief that Americans have till this day that they are in a special place where you are rich if you work hard, where you will have your children live at a better standard than you and your grandchildren even better and so forth. All of that stopped in the 1970s when the long-term labor shortage of the United States uh, ended. You have to understand that the reason the wages rose was we never had enough labor. We had a successful capitalism without workers. Partly because we killed all the Indians we found there when we first came as, as Europeans. And afterwards, the capitalism was successful and there weren't enough workers, which is why we are a nation of immigrants, one after the other. But in the 1970s, it stopped. The computer meant we didn't need people so much. American corporations moved out of the United States in huge numbers for cheap labor elsewhere, for example, China and India. And finally, the women's liberation movement moved millions of women into the labor market. So you had less demand for jobs because of computers and export of, of work, and more people looking, women and more immigrants keep coming. The result was real wages stopped rising. For the first time in US history as a country, since the 1970s, the real wage, the amount of money a worker gets adjusted for the prices that have to be paid is flat. This is a trauma. It is a psychological problem for a culture that has expected rising wages. No one discussed it in the 1970s. It was not recognized as a problem. So every American family tried to solve it itself by doing two things. One, more work. Americans work more hours of paid labor per year than any other country, advanced industrial country about 20% more hours of paid labor per year than a German or a French or an Italian. I mean, a fundamental difference. And it meant over the last 30 years the American worker is physically exhausted. Because the women leave the home to work because the wages aren't going up, the family is falling apart because the women held it together and they are now exhausted too. But the most important thing is that the working class of America starting in the 1970s to deal with the trauma of no more rising wages, decided to keep on consuming as they had been promised they could, 
as they had promised to their children, you will have a college education, you will have a car, you will have a nice home, blah, 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 blah. They borrowed the money. And for 30 years, the American working class borrowed more money than any working class in the world had ever borrowed. For their home, for their car, for their credit card, and for their university education. All workers, all students in the United States now graduate with debt. 30 years ago, almost no students had debt. So by 2007, we had an exhausted working class. It couldn't work any more hours. It couldn't borrow any more money. It couldn't send any more people out from the household to work. They were finished. And the rise in the economy was over. And it collapsed. The economy built on rising consumption for 150 years couldn't anymore. There was no way it was going to happen. At the same time, the, the wealth of America got shifted. For 30 years, if the wages are the same, the productivity of workers kept rising. So the worker produced more each year. Better machines, more machines, new computers, faster labor, better training. So the worker output that delivered to the employer goes up for the last 30 years, every year. But what the employer gives to the worker is flat for 30 years because there's no longer a labor shortage. So you have the working class, cannot get any more money, has to borrow all the money to keep on consuming. But the employer class is wealthier than ever before because they get all the gains of productivity for 30 years and they don't have to raise their wages. And it has transformed the United States first the employer class paid themselves fantastic salaries. The executives at the top of American corporations get much more relative to executives at the top of German or French or Italian. They paid themselves this enormous sum of money. Number two, they moved in to shape politics. They were smart. They understood that if they become relatively more wealthy and the mass of people don't, you better control the political system or else the working class will use the political system to nullify what they're doing. So American workers who were exhausted with all their labor withdrew from politics and the employers took all the extra money and moved in to shape politics. So that now the Republican and Democratic Party are both dependent on money from the same employer class, which is why whether you have Bush or Obama, the differences are very small. We have one party with two factions in the United States and no, no opposition to handle the new problem of a highly unequal society. And so the crisis comes when the mass of people cannot keep it going and the rich have speculated on all the debts. So when, for example, I say to you that over the last 30 years the American working class borrowed more money, who do they borrow it from? From the employer because they were making the employer richer and richer, the employer lent them the money instead of paying wages increasing, which is what they had done previously. So from an employer's point of view, it was fantastic. You no longer raise the workers' wages. Instead, you lend them money. So they have to pay you back and pay interest. But of course, after 30 years, as the debt of the working class goes up, but the underlying wage doesn't, you reach a point where you can't pay your debts. In 2007, the crisis begins when masses of people cannot pay their debts. It's a little bit like thinking of the American working class like the Greeks today. They cannot pay. Their debts are impossible. And therefore, the system has no way of solving the problem. The only way to enable the working class to resume consumption is to hire all of them and pay her higher wages. The capitalist class can't do that, doesn't want to do that, resists every effort to make them do that. And the irony is, by doing this, the capitalist class undermines its own situation. And that's why the crisis is so severe. There's no way out without massive changes that the capitalist class, the employer class, will not do. And so you have the situation. And it is just as serious in the United States as in Europe, in many ways more serious. The irony is that all the attention these days is on little Greece or Italy. But the much bigger problem is the United States. The debts of the United States, of one country, 
are much larger than those of Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, France combined. So it is a peculiar situation that the world right now is focused on Europe, Southern Europe, when in fact the big problem coming down the road is the United States. We already have as debt more than our GDP. When the trouble with Greece began, their debt was 130% of their GDP. Ours now is already about 105 and 110 and moving towards 135 fast. For example, in 2011, the increase in our debt will be 10%. 1.5 trillion on a debt of 14.5 trillion, so roughly 10%. The estimated rate of economic growth of output this year, 2%. Our debt is rising five times faster than our GDP. It's only a matter of two or three years before we are at where Greece was when the crisis in Greece began. But people are not looking at the situation. They're not accepting, because they don't want to, how serious the crisis is. Not in the United States. And here in Europe, because you're busy looking at your European problems, you don't see that there's a large elephant running towards you, and you sooner or later are going to have to do something about this elephant. We are seeing protests all over the place. We are seeing the Occupy movements in the United States. Um, yesterday there was a general strike in Oakland, unprecedented strike, one has to say. We are seeing protests in Greece and Spain. What are your thoughts on these movements and where are they heading? I think the movements are successful in bringing an immense array of people together with very different issues, priorities and programs. So they refuse to pick one or two. They're not going to tell us. And that's very, very smart because they are gathering together 30 years of people angry about this problem, racial issue, economic issue, gender issue, whatever it is, they gather, they're saying to all of them, you have tried little social movements for your own issue. It hasn't worked. In order to make real progress around gender, racial, ethnic, we have to get everybody together. We can only change the system if we are unified and have the strength of enormous numbers. And this is working. That's why people are coming together. They are not fighting each other. It should be that we fight for racial issues, or it should be that we fight against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. No, no, no. They understand we are bringing everybody together. Later on, we'll worry about which issue when. But at first, we have to be strong enough to make a difference. We're not going to make the mistake of being fighting out and then separating and splitting. This group does this. We're not going to do it very important, and that's why they're so successful. They, every attempt has been made by the police to repress it. Failure. The police have failed, including in Oakland. If you follow what happened in Oakland, a, a bad case of the police overreacting, the mayor, who ordered the police in, went on the television the day after, Mayor Kwan, a woman, and completely recanted, said she was sorry, she made a mistake, she should never have done that. The, the police Chief is now openly fighting with the mayor. We haven't seen this before. There was a general strike yesterday. It was very successful. It closed the port of Oakland, one of the most important ports on the west coast of the United States. It had walkouts of public employees, private employees. There hasn't been a general strike of this sort in the United States for at least a quarter of a century, if not longer. This is the first one, and it was quite successful. So I think you're seeing a movement determined to grow, determined to question the whole thing. Let me make one more point about it. From the beginning, this movement has said that it is against the entire system. It doesn't want a little change here. The law changed. That's not the problem. The problem isn't this or that or the other. It is the system as a whole. And they've been willing to give a name to the system, and the name is capitalism. I've been active in every major political movement in the United States since 1955-60, because I've been around that long. In the past, those of us who wanted to argue that capitalism is a part of the problem had great difficulty to do that. 
that was seen as dangerous or disloyal or too much. Or, that's not the case anymore. I go everywhere. I've been speaking at many of the Occupy movements. I talk about the problem as capitalism, and that's acceptable. Not everybody agrees, but it's an acceptable part of this movement. That's another way. This is completely different. This is a challenge to the system as a whole, and it is determined not to be reduced to something affecting this subgroup or that subgroup. This is a change, and it's it's been successful in getting that across to the American people. A movement which says openly that capitalism is the problem is now getting between 55 and 60 percent sympathy in every national poll conducted by the New York Times, CBS, and so on. So here's a movement that is more radical than anything we've seen, and within one and a half months of existence has the majority of the American people expressing sympathy. The left had never believed it could do that. And we've already done it, and we're just at the beginning. Thank you for being with us, Richard Wolf.